Hi, and welcome back to SEO on Air. I'm your host, Aaron, and today we have Elton Mayfield, president of ER Marketing with us. We talk about changes in the SEO industry over the years, content marketing, and how you can build a stronger brand. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, in that 20 years time, I think this might be kind of a large answer for this, but in that 20 years time, how much have you seen change in relation to SEO, content marketing, just the entire digital marketing sphere? Well, I mean, honestly, those categories, if you go back 20 years, uh, didn't really even didn't exist. exist. Uh, you know, yeah. a good example is, you know, when we would think of SEO uh, and search, uh, finding that business or, you know, I need somebody to do something. Uh, we go to Google, we search. Well, it used to be yellow pages. And so if you needed to find the, you know, your hot water heater went out, you need an electrician or your garage door broke, you need somebody to come to your house, you had to go find the yellow pages, which is a big printed yellow book for those that didn't know it. Uh, <laughs> but you actually went through it. And uh, it was very easy to be, you know, listed first. And I think of the difference. I mean, the yellow pages printed and it was there for a year. So it'd be the equivalent of Google locking their algorithm and their rankings today, and it's not changing for a year. So if you're first, you're staying first. Um, but it's interesting to think, you know, I, I use Yellow Pages comparative to even Google Search a lot because it is, it, it functions the same way that I'm looking for something. I'm going to go find it. I'm going to accept it was all alphabetical. Uh, but people used to, you know, hack the Yellow Pages and they would name their business the AAA something. So they would be listed first because it was alphabetical. Just like people tried to hack SEO and like, let's stuff it with all these words that don't make sense. And guess what? The system figures it out and it gets smarter over time. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's the obvious way, but uh, just the way people consume information. We're very, uh, it's a very customer consumer. And when I say customer, it could be a B2B or B2C, but it's a very customer centric communication now. Um, I want my communication the way I want it, how I want it, when I want it, uh, which is, you know, the advent of this, you know, this very medium, a podcast. I want to, I want that information, but I want to listen to it when I want to listen to it. That would be your show. So how did this kind of come about during your initial years at the company? Did you feel that you had to, like, it was probably very new at that time as well. So what were you really thinking about? Uh, you know, honestly, I, I don't even remember thinking about SEO when we first started remember we still did some yellow pages for some of our local dealer local clients um and we we started building a few websites but uh, you know the the difference in technology in 20 years is staggering and and a lot of people don't realize how how much it's different and uh and it seems you know not to be the you know, the old guy it was it's much harder back in the good old days well i don't know if it was the good old days because we did a lot of activities that we didn't we couldn't tell if it worked or using yellow pages as an example, I'm going to run a big ad. I don't, I'm committed all year. I can't change it. Uh, same way with, with print and, you know, thinking about, I do a brochure and I can't change. Well, now I've got a website I can change and modify on a daily basis. If I want. And so, you know, I think it's exciting how it happened, but as that technology just became more and more, you know, readily available, accessible, um, and then also expected. And that's that, consumer communication habits have changed so much you have to be able to be to constantly adapt change to what your audience wants and when they want it and how they want to consume it uh, we've seen content you know and that's changed too you know the advent of video content uh you know, this little snackable content and so much video content now is available i don't even you know don't want to read the book. I want an audio book or I want to listen to a podcast or I want to watch a video. Uh, I'm not going to read the instruction manual. I'm going to Google how to install this thing. <laughs> we'll do it. That's just how, that's how we, you know, that's how we, and that's how I, my, my twins that are just graduate high school, that's how they learn. That's the first place they go. They just naturally go and watch a video on YouTube on how to fix something, how to do something. But like you said, nowadays it's so ready available. You can just Google exactly what you want and get like a hundred results to uh, give you what you need. Mm -hmm. When my son and I went on, um, we went to Japan in April. Uh, so a couple of months ago, uh, or early this year. Uh, but that would be unimaginable for me at his age because of the information wasn't, it literally would have been in the J encyclopedia. 
and I would have read four pages about Japan. Uh, but when we talked about it, he already knew, you know, where we were going to go, certain areas within Tokyo, uh, where we wanted to see this and this and this. Uh, it, we recently, you know, the information is readily available and quickly available. So the I don't know is you can't say that today's world and survive. Not not that you have a phone. I mean, a computer. You can everyone can know. Uh, and you know, we neither one of us speak Japanese. We went there. We used Google Translate. Uh, Uber worked there. So if we needed a car, again, the technology is just it's rapidly evolving. And so again, the same thing as a as a buyer in this case, travel. I could do the research. I could figure it out. I, I'm looking at reviews. All these SEO tactics all come into play no matter what we do. I'm looking for reviews. What hotel? What's the restaurants? Which place should we go? Because Tokyo's got a lot of options. So I want to find out which one's the best. And, you know, and so guess what? Search optimization works. Flat out works. So does reviews, all of the items that we talk about. Yeah, you probably have to carry a yellow book, um, a Google, I mean, a a translation book as well, and then like three or four other books. If you had to do this back in the day, yeah, it would have been overwhelming. And you're constantly and you're looking up the word, and then I'm trying to figure out how to pronounce it. It's not just okay. I have the word. Um, it's characters. Now I can. I'm going to read a pronunciation key and hope I get it right. That's a you know language is is you know and then the world is much you know it's smaller and accessible now. So again, we're in different parts of the of the world as well. Or I recall, it's crystal clear. Video, you could be in the other road. It wouldn't matter. I, I was going to make a joke out there about how the only people who don't know anything nowadays would be those who are too young enough to actually know what yellow pages were back in the day. <laughs> One thing that I can say is that if you are a short person, yellow pages is what you use to kind of sit at the movie theater so you can see above everyone else. Yes, yes. We also used to have uh, catalogs. Yeah, the, the Sears, which isn't around anymore, you know, used to produce big, big catalogs. And so... Um, I know some people that used to use those to sit to be high enough, even to drive a yeah, car. I'm using one right now to stand <laughs> up. But yeah, I think nowadays if you don't really <clears throat> know something that happened back in the past, it's probably because you were way too young to kind of really understand it. Uh, it kind of goes back to me and my SEO days. Um, I kind of started my SEO journey a couple of years ago itself. So if people ask me about the Penguin update or the Panda update, uh, for a good amount of time, I just had no idea because I just never knew what was going on back in the time. Right. Um, but or, you have that extensive knowledge. In, oh, sorry. Yeah. I mean, if I, you know, you can see your order history in Amazon. Well, my first order on Amazon was in 1999. It was on a flip phone where they truly just did books and CDs, DVDs. May I even done DVDs to begin with. And it was a flip phone that just did numbers. It was a monochrome display. So you had to scroll down to four, hit four, that was books, and then scroll through letters. Now I've got the books that begin with, you know, uh, B, and then I've got to find those. Uh, it's it's mind-boggling to think what that, like I, to give that to a, a 25-year-old today, they'd be like, I don't even know what to do with this. Yeah, they, I think They'd be like yelling much... at the phone, hey Siri, order this book. It's like, it doesn't do that. Yeah. So. Yeah, I was going to say that's pretty much what you can do now. <laughs> oh, see, my phone just went off. It's, I said her name, and she says, how can I help? So That was the perfect timing to show how far technology has come. Um, but I think we can probably talk about how far also um, ER marketing has come, since it kind of started off 20 plus years ago, like you said. Um, well, one I, thing I need to ask you is, what were the pillars of strength for the company to kind of make it last that long? Well, I think... Part of it is we, when we started, and I had a business partner, I'm the E, and then I had a business partner, Renee. She was the R. That's where the name came from. Uh, we've never done hospital or emergency room marketing. It was just our initials. Uh, it came from, a lot of it came from this idea that, again, we were clients uh, before. We had agencies who were very good at this one thing or that thing. And they always wanted to sell you their solution as opposed to actually listening to what the business challenge is. And I think that's where, you know, where we have, you know, not just survived 20 years, but we have clients that we've had for in excess of 15 years, whether it's a lot of storms with them as well, through business and cycles is, is really listening to your, your customers, your clients. Uh, we're in a business to business space predominantly, but 
what is the business issue they're trying to solve? We're currently in the midst of a complete website overhaul for, for a client. And it's a completely rebuild. We're not just refreshing it, but completely recoding it from the ground up. And at the end of the day, the business challenge isn't that they didn't like the way the old site looked. It's just when it was built, the technology has become outdated. It's difficult to update. The business challenge is it's very hard to maintain. It's so difficult to maintain, much like if you had a very old car, it's very difficult to find parts for. It's hard to work on. I can't get things done. It takes a lot longer. And so that's really, you know, that I think is, has been at our, I guess at our core is being curious to, to hear what is the business issue that we're trying to solve. Because many times companies have business issues that aren't our quote unquote marketing issues. Uh, it could be, it could be a, a myriad of, of issues, but let's, those are the roadblocks or at least the speed bumps to getting to that next next situation and so let's solve that for people sometimes it's not us it's like you know you're clearly struggling with x I, I know some people that do that maybe you should talk to them uh let's get that done because that's something that and so i think that idea of solving the problem so again at the end of the day we're a solution provider there are thousands of agencies that do what we do functionally a lot of seo agencies you know paid search agencies web design print trade show whatever um it's a matter of uh, listening to really understand the business and being a real good partner. Uh, everybody says that. I was a client for years before we had agency. So um, I used to say we, we hired and fired a lot of agencies. And so uh, it was typically because they just didn't listen to what we were trying to do. Um, and so that I think is part of it. Uh, you know, being curious and then just, you know, really that has driven a lot of it too. Uh, I think you have to so you have to be curious in today's world to survive because things are changing. You know, they're related. I mean, I, I explain. You know, SEO. I like our traditional creatives. Uh, they use you know the Pantone color book. It's been, that hasn't changed. That's exactly Pantone four eighty five or one eighty five is still the red, and it has been for decades. That didn't change. I said, imagine if I came in and said the colors. The names of the colors changed, but I'm not going to tell you what they changed to. Welcome to SEO. Because the rules oh, you, by which you have to play by have just changed, but you don't know what they changed. So 185 now is a different color. And out in the ether somewhere, somebody's going to, we're going to all try and guess and figure it out. We're going to talk to each other. And we're going to get on Reddit. We're going to blogs and we're going to listen to all these experts. And we're going to figure out that, oh, that actually now is a blue. Okay. And that's how I, you know, when, when that's the, the fundamental difference our, that is so different from traditional, and we still do a lot of traditional, but those Pantone colors are still exactly the same. We use, you know, in the, in the, in the States, it's letter, it's, uh, you know, it's eight and a half by 11. In Europe, it's eight and a half by 14 or it's illegal. Well, those have been the same one that hasn't changed for decades, maybe longer. Well, imagine if things changed in those core fundamental methods and how you work and your constant that's that's the world of digital marketing. PPC it's changing like that to you know, like how the keywords and keyword research and what do people call this and our you know, short term or short tail, long tail, like all these things are changing so fast and so rapidly. But in SEO we don't even know what it is. We just know they released an update. What's the update? I can't tell you. What? I mean, you say that loud and you're like, What that is crazy. But that's just the world we live in. And, and rightfully so, because as marketers, we would run the system if we knew how to. Um, but we've had talk about podcast and uh, blogs in general, and I think now also TikTok and other social media channels to promote marketing endeavors. So do you feel there is, let's say, some specific marketing channels that are better for biz businesses? Or do you feel like what we've already talked about, it does depend on what you kind of look out for? I mean, I think it does depend to a certain degree. Um, LinkedIn's still a very good channel for the professional audience uh, because we can target by, because in many ways, many times in the B2B world, um, if we know our audience, again, marketing is knowing your audience and well, who's the buyer of that product? And then sometimes it's very narrow. So uh, identifying your buyer or your potential buyer, your audience 
uh, account-based marketing. I really want to, I want to reach people that work at this business. Okay. Um, there's, there's some benefits of a LinkedIn type of a profile. Um, but you know, we've tested and, and found success with just about any medium from digital to offline, uh, great shows, uh, promotions. So I think- Would you say there's a medium that you personally prefer? Oh, personally, um, I mean, in the B2B space, I still, I still like trade shows a lot, but I'm, uh, I like the face-to-face interaction uh, and the ability to talk to a customer live. And again, we don't actually, we don't, we don't do trade shows. We, or we don't exhibit at trade shows, but we have a lot of clients that do. And because they're typically very narrowly focused as well. And so, you know, these trade shows about one topic or another, it might be the pool and spa industry. Well, the whole industry is right there. It might be 20,000 people, could be 50,000 people. Um, I still like those, um, but I'm also a huge, you know, if, if I had to pick one thing right now, and, and this sounds like I'm, I've said this several times, it isn't because of this podcast and the topic, but I would say invest in SEO right now. I have, there's just nothing better. Um, for a return, um, fundamentally, I can, sh- I can, sh- I've got data. It's not an opinion. Uh, as I say, don't bring, you know, opinions to a data fight. This is just data. I can show you with data that an organic search web visitor is fundamentally better in every key metric than any other web visitor you get. It may come from social, it may come from PPC, trade show lead, whatever. But if they find you organically, they're going to spend more time. They're going to look around, they're going to convert higher. The return on your investment is going to be a multiplier. You know, low in four or five times could be, we've seen as high as 10 X return on the investment for SEO. So, um, had that conversation many times over the last couple of months where we're really, you know, know, what, what for sure gives us the best return that I know is, I mean, do I know it's going to work again? I can guarantee first place. Can, I can tell you long term, there's probably nothing better for you than doing that. Uh, and uh, it's just it pays such long term dividends too. It will help you now, but it will forever help you if you can, you know, just get on that path. Um, so yeah, I, I a huge fan. Of it. I know that's the primary topic here, but uh, that's not why I'm saying that. I, I've said that a lot. Uh, just because I've seen such positive impact, but such a long-term benefit. Uh, fundamentally, it's not like people are going to stop searching. I feel like Google's a pretty safe business. They, they, you know, Yes, there's other avenues of search, but at the end of the day, they're going to end up at your website too. And uh, But how do they get there? So, Yeah, and I think um, this, is, this is kind of like a shameless plug, but if you do need SEO help, um, and you're listening into this podcast, by all means, reach out to Stan Ventures or ER Marketing, and we will probably kind of help you out with whatever needs you do have. Um, but for the podcast part of it, just between you and me, um, what are some, let's say, um, campaigns that have been done with clients that you feel had to balance some diff- uh, diverse tactics, let's say? I think, uh, you know, that's, you know, people say one thing or two things. I am not a fan of just doing one thing at all. Uh, so I think you need almost almost everything that we we do. We try multiple channels of communication. Um, we've done product launch. We've got a, a not relatively new. We've worked with them for four or five years, but they're a uh, manufacturer of a stone product that is um, built out the brand, worked on the branding website, got it ready, and then started promoting. You know, in traditional, they were at trade shows, but we did email marketing done and direct marketing done physical display samples things like that that you would see um all we've done everything including tiktok uh facebook instagram everything um all driving awareness um and that product is a product that you need you want to see and it's a very unique product in that you it's a it's a man-made stone product but it looks very very real but to install it you actually nail through the face of the stone. It's got a patented process. It's, it's pretty amazing, pretty innovative product. Well, when we first uh, first saw this product, I, you know, we work with a lot of manufacturers. I see a lot of products. Um, there's new and improved, but real, seldom is there true innovation um, like this was. 
And so this one, this campaign, I, I just, it worked across so many different channels because everything that was visual, because you needed to see, see somebody hold the stone up and, it's, and actually take a nail gun and, and nail the stone in, and then you didn't see the nail. And so once you saw it, you were very intrigued. So we get more social engagement, YouTube engagement, um, influencers reaching out going, this is like, can I see this? Not because they weren't paid. No, they just know this is, this would be good for their audience. Uh, you know, trade show traffic, it, you know, it worked across. And so part of it is we had a compelling story and that's where it gets down to is, you know, you can, as I, on the consumer side, a lot of times it's, I would say, if I have enough money for the media, I can make it work. Uh, I can, I can, if you have enough money, I can run enough ads for pizza at dinner time. Somebody's hungry, they're going to buy a pizza. Um, so, but in this world, it's like, you need to see this product, but I have a very, very compelling story that's unique. It truly is different. And we get caught up a lot of times as marketers like, oh, this is a you know, this is most incredible. You know, this this Yeti mug is incredible. There's a lot of really good mugs out there. It doesn't have to be a Yeti. So at the end of the day, the parody is is there, but what's my story? And so um, the story was compelling that it made sense across all these channels, not just because they were a startup. They didn't have huge budgets. So we really had to make sure everything worked. But again, with that idea that consumers or people that consume information, not just a consumer, but everybody, we want information how we want it. So for this case, because it was new, very important to have on multiple channels. In person at a trade show, uh, dealer uh, it displays if they walked into a, a retail setting. Uh, if they signed up somewhere, they got an email. Uh, there was follow-up. There was social media that it was easy to share. Like, oh, you've got to see this product. So part of it is, you know, when I think about cross-integrated and I, I think almost every campaign has to have some level of integration because just one or two channels isn't enough. Not everybody's on Facebook. Not everybody's on Instagram. Not everybody's on Twitter. Whatever channel you pick, um, not everybody's at that trade show. Well, you've got to, and, and then making content that's shareable. Uh, people want to, you know, they want to view it, but also they want to share it to their friends because guess what? As an agency owner, I have several friends that are agency owners. Uh, as a home builder, I would have I, I would know multiple people that are home builders. Well, if I see something that's interesting, I'm going to share it to other people. My circle is like me, you know, my friends, other things. And so this idea of, you know, I want to get it out in front of as many people in different formats so that they can see it and then share it and tell other people because it is new and different. So that's, you know, that campaign specifically, and it was, he used the phrase nailed it. Uh, it was just an expression, but it liter it was literally what we did. Um, and so if I said, I'm going to put a nail through stove, people like, wait, how, no, that doesn't work. You can't do that. Well, yeah, we can't. And so that made for, you know, a, a simple story, a compelling story that could be spread uh, and worked very well for him. So that's the one that comes to mind just a lot. You mentioned if I did see it, I would be curious about it. But while listening to it, I was like, wait a minute, how how are they putting a nail through stone? I, now I really do have to like Google it and actually find out more about it. It's uh, The product's name is Evolved Stone. And we talked about how it's the next evolution of stone. So it, it looks like real stone, uh, which it should. Um, but the installation is what makes it different. Uh, you you don't need mortar and cement and it's not as late, you know, uh, it's not impacted by weather. Uh, there's just a lot of really amazing features about the product. Uh, but when you see it and then you think, man, you're like, wait a minute, I can do that. The speed of it is considerably different too. Uh, that's the speed in half or the installation in half. So which is, again, it's enough that you see a little bit, you're like, wait a minute. And that same reaction, like, wait, I want to learn more about it. Okay. So then you dig into it more and you realize, again, for most people, the implications to structure and engineering aren't going to come into play. But if you wanted to put it on a chimney, for example, or some like a chimney out of a home, normal, you know, a traditional stone is heavy and then mortar or cement is heavy. So you have to reinforce that chimney. Well, this is lighter, so you don't have to. So now I don't have to spend structural engineers to come in and reinforce this. I can put it up anywhere I want. 
So again, it, it's just, it created this and then it just it spread like that. And so, uh, but yeah, the biggest trade show of the year, they were named the most innovative product and actually the product of the year. So uh, we're, you know, and again, that's, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to take all the claim for it. It is truly a better product. And, you know, that's part of it. Most of the products are not that different. It's a matter of nuanced differences. Um, you know, most of the most of their competitors talk about how it looks real. Okay, well, it's it should look real, shouldn't it? Of course, it looks. I mean, if it doesn't look real, to. it's going to look bad. Who's going to buy it? Ugly, fake stone. Nobody's buying that product. <laughs> so no sometimes we get googling that either. Because <laughs> sometimes we we come up with, you know, we say these features and benefits about products, and it's like, well, shouldn't it? I mean, right. If you're an automaker and you talk about safety, like, isn't every car safe? Like, and maybe there's a yeah. varying degrees, but I mean, some of these, you, you know. You expect it to be the standard. Right. Food should be, you know, should taste good, right? You, the right. restaurant should meet safety. You, hey, we have an authentic service. You're like, wait, shouldn't your service be authentic? Why are you, mm-hmm. why are you mentioning it? Mm-hmm. And, or the, you know. And I used to say it until I, you know, I caught myself saying this at times. I would say, well, honestly, I'm like, so are normally you not honest when you talk to me? Right, right. <laughs> it kind of makes you want, like, wonder what exactly goes on through that thought process. Mm-hmm. When they come and put up being like, hey, trust us, definitely not a scam. What is it? Like, Wait a minute. Mm. <laughs> well, yeah. oh, but one question I wanted to ask is that with, I think you mentioned it was called Evolve Stone? Yes. That's the stone product, so, Evolve. So how long back did you kind of get that campaign? Or was this more of a recent campaign? Well, uh, we started working with them before it was even on the market. And so again, talking about like business challenges. So um, met the owner of the company. We started, you know, he'd sent me a little information about the product and we were talking. He found us because we work in the space. Uh, a CEO works. Um, and then we started talking and he hadn't even gone to market. Um, and when I saw the product, I, you know, I recognized that there is, you know, uh, to see uniqueness, of it. but we started talking about, you know, the business challenges because, okay, you can make a product as a manufacturer. How do you get market? How do you get product ultimately on a home or a building? And it's that whole channel. So you've got wholesale distributors, dealers, professional contractors, homeowners, all these people. <clears throat> we probably, we probably talked and had meetings, uh, for at least 18 months on this before he even watched um flew out to meet him at a at a show one time before it was even a client because part of it was just figuring out talking through the because the business challenges well how do i even get it out there like i can make it but how do people buy it because i'm not just going to open up an e-commerce nobody's just going to buy the product online so i said oh and i saw a picture on my own website of how you can nail it no i want to see professionals or other people talking about it, using it, seeing how good it is. I want to see it in person. I want to go to a local home improvement store. And so that was a lot of working with that to really understand the business. And here's pluses and minuses because we work with a lot of manufacturers. So what are the pluses and minuses of wholesale to direct to do, you know, all these things. And so working through that and then really working on the, on the brand component. And so Yes, there's a brand name, but what's the brand messaging platform? Like what, what's our, you know, all the, these are marketing, you know, one-on-one things, but also, you know, really digging into it. I think it's really easy to get, okay, well, we, you know, beautiful, natural looking stone product. Yep. So is everybody. So, you know, that's where we ended up with Nailed It, which is obvious, but leading with it on and on and on. And why is that different? How that makes, you know, so you can nail it. Well, what's that mean to me? So digging into what what is the that's a pain point. So how do we solve the pain point? Because many times we we do we solve problems for people they don't realize they have, and people are looking for something and they don't realize sometimes that that's something that could be fixed. Oh, I didn't realize I could. Again, I'm going to plan a trip to Japan. If you don't realize the internet exists, and you go to your J encyclopedia. That's, you know, but if we told you, wait, there's this thing, you go and get all this information about it. Wow. It's enlightening. Well, same thing. Imagine if you could install it without this, this, and this. 
Uh, you can just fall and install it in half the time because the nail that is the key thing, but it's really, what does that mean to you? Cause I, now you could put it up in your home and, or, you know, in one day you could change, you could change your fireplace and make the wall stone or so part of it is yes, the nail that made sense, but what is that? Why, why does that matter to me? So you have to, you know, but really understanding all those stops in the supply, you know, in the sales channel too, of what's the pain point for a dealer? Because a dealer, a store doesn't want to carry a product that their customers aren't going to buy. It's retail 101. So I need to make sure that you're driving demand for the end user. So they're going to come and buy it here because I could buy it and nobody knows about it. So you got to create awareness, which, you know, see, say these and it's like, well, that's marketing. Isn't it? That's basic level. You have to create awareness, drive demand, and then have it in, in stock and ready to go. And Okay. So that's the same thing could be said for pizza. So that's where that crossover, it's very similar. People are still, you know, you're solving a problem for people. In this case, I'm hungry, I need pizza, or I want something different. I want more of an organic product in my home like so. Well, how can I do that? There's a solution. So we've had great success with them now as they've built up with blogs and content. And so really working on blog content specifically for them that is very, very targeted on, they fall into what's called mortarless stone. Mortar is the cement that you would put up to put a stone on the wall. Well, that's our core. We're not going to compete with someone that wants a real stone product. Like it's not, and that's not who we are. So we're staying focused on where we are. And that's part of, you know, SEO too is we need to know what story we really have and what's all that story and be the best and, and, and drive demand around that because we're not, uh, you know, we're not a, a, a real stone. If you want stone, if you're a stone mason, you don't like our product. You know, so that's okay. Just like if you're a vegetarian, you don't like Tyson's chicken. I mean, it's okay. It's not for you. Um, and so that's where we've spent a lot of our effort to, you know, um, is really, we spent a lot of time on SEO uh, because it works because we can own this story. And it's a, and the story's broad enough too. I mean, you have to have search volume that makes sense, but. And one thing that I can pretty much, um, add on to is that uh, this is what my dad used to tell me is that if you fail to prepare you are preparing to fail and i think seo is that kind of tactic that you need to do in order to not fail it's a, there's a lot of preparation and then you're kind of you, i wouldn't say you're good to go after you do seo you still have to continuously update yourself but like you said there are long-term results that you have to put in that effort to actually get it well then you know like the analogy in construction and you know you've got to you've got to Pair, scope, um, determine where the, the land, if you're going to build a home, where's the house going to go? Uh, there's blueprints. There is a tremendous amount of work that goes into building a home before you ever actually build it. And at that point, it's not easy. You have to have skilled craftsmen to build a home, but there's a plan. And they know the door goes right here and it swings this way. Because if you just, and, and I know this wall will hold up the second floor of my home. Because if it's not done this way, it doesn't work. And so, yeah, we 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 talk about that a lot because SEO is the you know the audit, the analysis. It's all of that up front. And then it's like, okay, now I'm going to build. I'm going to do. You know, I'm going to say we can if if we do the the plan. We have you know here's an outline for a blog. A writer can write that, and it is spot on. But it's having the outline on you know with like my housing analogy. You have the blueprint. I can get a blueprint about any home builder and they can build that home for me because they know what that means. That's a door. It's 32 inches. It's this tall. It swings left or right. Great. You know what, what to do. Uh, but without it, I just said, build me a home. And that's, you know, people that, you know, I get, I love those questions. Well, we need a new web. What would a new website cost? I don't know. I mean, 10,000, 1 million, somewhere in between, <laughs> you know, without a plan, yeah, I have no price. idea. We're just going to build and build and build. Well, that doesn't work. Would you build a house without them? Just give me some lumber and I'll start putting up walls and we'll figure it out. But I think that um, with that much years of experience, if you do kind of assert yourself in the online sphere, um, if people do reach out to you to, for any kind of, um, let's say, SEO or marketing help, they kind of already know that you are an established expert in the field. Um, so the same kind of question I want to apply to, let's say, construction industries. 
how exactly can they boost their online presence so that when people do reach out for their services, um, they can also like trust them and feel that they are valid and can come up with an actual plan. I think, you know, in today's, in today's search world, especially if you talk about like construction companies, we're talking about local companies. In today's search world, local is king. It has been for some time, but, you know, Google will reward the local business. Uh, it's just part of their, their algorithm. They assume you want a business that's close to you. And so if I'm looking for a construction, a service, even a restaurant, really anything, but it's all about the local business and so local content and you know and so some of our well evolve is a national client um we have other national manufacturers that then have pages on their website they have a page for every dealer across north america um, those are a gold mine for seo because when i'm looking for you know if i want a, a home builder i want new windows google just assumes near me <laughs> Uh, and I see Google, but all search, everything is looking for the local solution. Like I'm in Kansas City. I'm in the middle of the United States. It, uh, I don't need a window installer in California. That's of no use to me. So, yeah, I'm smart enough to figure that out. Well, so focusing on making sure that all of my local, you know, everything from directories to content, Google business listings, everything is focused on. And then, you know, your, your, your uh, website is to talk about. What are the markets you serve? Do you actually say, you know, well, we serve Kansas City, we serve this, you know, because again, every city has multiple towns, means in it. Uh, does, uh, so we do a lot around local. You know, if I were in the in the construction business, for sure, is is making sure that I am that the search engines know that I serve this area. Uh, but then, secondarily, is reviews, and we we work with talk to clients a lot about reviews. Um, I've spoken on reviews to groups um, related to service, let's just say in the service industry, our home service industry. Uh, I've asked them to you know, look yourself up on Yelp. Uh, Yelp is not just restaurants. Uh, Yelp has deck builders, roofers, uh, patio pool builders. They're all in there. And that's that idea that it's, you know, a very uh, unique, uniquely my communication channel. I also have a unique voice. I can go to Twitter. Uh, most most brands have a customer service on Twitter, uh, but I can also review you on Yelp. So we we talk to, you know about when we talk to local businesses, it's a lot about reviews. Reviews are used by everyone. Uh, they are becoming more and more important in the search algorithm. Uh, they are a factor in it. Uh, do you have reviews on your website? Do you ask for reviews? Do you gather reviews? Uh, because everyone has a voice, you're going to get bad reviews. Because at some point, if you work with people, especially today, uh, I think you know people just have a, an easy way to vent and voice their displeasure. Um, I have myself. There's been times where I'm like, okay, wow, this is not what I usually get from fill in the blank. Uh, it could be an airline, a hotel, whatever. Uh, and so, really making sure that your 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 data is correct, your listings, day directories. Uh, make sure your website talks about your local market that you serve, but pushing reviews as much as you can on every platform that you can and monitoring them. Uh, we see so many negative reviews that have been out there for two years and they're still sitting there. Like, do you know that, you know, we'll bring them up. They're like, oh, I didn't even know that I could get reviewed on Yelp. Like, yeah. Yeah, you can. Um, if you're an employer, uh, have you looked at your company profile on Glassdoor? to see what your former employees, because guess what? Your current employees probably aren't reviewing you on Glassdoor. I've asked my employees too, because they like it, right? They're currently employed. I assume they like it. Um, ask ask uh, employees who were let go, uh, who didn't get the job they interviewed for, or any of those, to, and then they leave a review. It's not usually positive. You didn't hire them. You didn't hire them, or you fired them. They're not happy. <laughs> so that's the part of it too is is your you know taking control of your brand because your brand is well taking control of being aware of your brand i guess because we're not in control that's probably a, the biggest fundamental shift we're not in control of communication or our brands anymore we used to be 20 years ago we're not uh customers drive what the brand experience is because they're going to tell everybody 
So you can say you're the best at it. Guess what? There's 600 reviews that say you're awful. That's your brand. No matter what you say, it doesn't matter. And that's what people are going to see. That's what Google's going to see. Google's going to be like, wow, they have awful reviews. They're a 1.5 star. That's probably not a good good result to provide. Okay. So uh, I guess probably the biggest biggest things we talk about a lot in the is that area. Yeah, and if you'd like to add on to it as well, um, I don't think companies or businesses should like shy away from negative reviews, or Good. if they do see, they should uh, by all means address it. Um, I think if you do have like 50 plus uh, five star reviews and zero one star reviews, it kind of kind of builds a bit of suspicion in some target audiences being like, wait, you seem a bit too perfect to be good. Right, right, right. Uh, but actually seeing the negative reviews on Yelp or other review platforms, you kind of you kind of trust them a bit more because you know that there are people out there reviewing them badly. Correct. And uh, I uh, recommend uh, a book all the time called Hug Your Haters by Jay Bear. And it's that same idea in that you're going to get reviews. You're going to hear negative. Uh, yes, sometimes it's unreasonable. And it was a customer you just were never going to please. But the biggest thing is not that you couldn't please them, but you left that negative review sitting there. I mean, it's okay. If I, when I see a negative review, I want to see how the company responded. And and he talks about that in the book as well. Is how do you handle negative reviews? Because at some point, you've got enough critical mass you're going to have a bad review. It can't be perfect to your point. Yeah. Uh, but okay. also, if you have a service uh, business with, a, you know, let's say you're in the construction industry, you have a lot of people doing service calls uh, to homes. Uh you continually get negative reviews about Bob. There might, you may have an issue with Bob. Into that. You know, yeah. uh, yes, Bob's a great guy when he's in office, but guess what? All of your negative reviews reference Bob, or Julie, or whatever, and it's like we should look at that. I'm not saying that they're right, wrong, or different, but it there are insights. If you're a restaurant and the food, you get a lot of reviews about how the food is cold. Okay, we need to figure this out. What are we doing wrong? No one wants cold food, unless it's supposed to be. But yeah, so that I, you know, but again, I I use that in a presentation a lot. Where this idea of uh, you're going to get bad reviews, well, that's okay. That just shows that you you're not perfect. No, again, to that point, we're also you know, and that's that change too. People are more sophisticated in how they use the internet. Or looking at a website from about five years ago. It would perform very well from a lead generation standpoint. I said, I, it'd be interesting to see it today because I think internet users today are just generally more sophisticated, probably a little jaded, a little, and I don't quite believe everything I see. So they're not going to quickly call that number because they assume you're going to try to sell them something. Well, okay. That's just, that's partly an evolution of communication and, you know, uh, expectation of communication. Okay, yeah, sorry. So the last question that I do kind of have um, is, well, not the last one, but kind of the last few ones, is what, you can, since you already mentioned the book, uh, what are some other books that you would kind of recommend our listeners and viewers? Uh, you know, I think there's a book, um, and Kim Scott, I think is her name, but it's called Radical Candor. And uh, she worked at, she was high level at Google, Facebook, you know, very impressive resume. Uh, but it was, it's, it's about how we communicate and it seems odd to think about it, but I think in the workplace, this is, is more true. Um, because everybody has a voice, sometimes people are, people are happy to be quite honestly mean on, on social media at times. I mean, they just say things, you know, like where's the decency and the human side of this, regardless of your views of stuff, you just, just do, don't, you don't have to be that way. But, Radical candor is is this idea that, you know, um, when there are situations, you speak about them right then. You're in a meeting, you see something, maybe something was said that wasn't completely accurate or there's, and again, not, it's not a pass to be rude to people, but it's more, her, her contention is we don't say things and they build up over time because we're in a work setting versus um, okay, when you were in this, when you were in that meeting, the way you presented this, maybe if we take, look at it this way, but you address them right away. Uh, I just like that idea. I think it's an opportunity for a lot of us to get better at that. Uh, but again, it's I'd say you know radical candor with compassion. Right? 
sometimes you read through part of it and you're like, oh, well then I just, no, it doesn't mean, you know, Joe, you were horrible at that. No, here's some opportunities to get better. Or when I saw you do this, this is how it made, or when you did that, this is how it made me feel. I appreciate your feedback, but like we don't hear that. And then employees leave because, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't know where my path was. I'm like, I didn't even know that was an issue for you or, you know, so uh, I like that a lot. Uh, I mentioned hug your haters. That's a good one too. Um, uh, he is very, this the author, his name is Gary John Bishop. He is uh, a Scottish author and it's uh, relevant because I'm a, I'm more of an audio book person and he has a very heavy accent uh, from Scotland, but his, his language is extremely salty. So he, he will, uh, he will offend you if cussing is, is offensive to you, but he, um, because he's so, he's so direct. And so there's a lot of, all of his titles have a square a word in it. So I won't say what they are, but they're all about basically just taking control of your situation and not being, not complaining about it. Like if you're unhappy with that situation, you either fix the situation or stop complaining about the situation. And so sometimes I find myself in that, like, oh, I need you, I need you. Well, then either do it or don't, you know? And, um, but I, I like that. Um, there's building a story brand is another one. Uh, that's a good book. Uh, uh, it's the author's last name. I'm blanking right now. Uh, that's a good one as well. Uh, I'm like, you know, again, it's different types of authors too. different, you know, like, you know, Gary John Bishop isn't a marketing author, but it's a, you know, it's kind of that slap in the face. That's why I like it audio wise. Cause a little bit of him and it's, wow, that's a bit aggressive, but sometimes you need that. Just wake up you know, or just different, you know, um, you know, I have a tendency to be around business or those type of books, but, uh, so I don't do a lot of, uh, fiction books. Um, but I think that's, that's another way to get different opinions, you know, um, hear ideas from different people, um, listening to, you know, um, whether it's audible, you read the book or whatever. Um, but, you know, the same way with podcasts, there's so many podcasts out there. It's, it's, it's awesome. You can just produce one yourself. I mean, it's great because you can find categories. Um, and it gives people a voice, um, and you can hear different topics. And, you know, I listened to, uh, this still have it. I think used to do a podcast with the, um, content marketing Institute founders, um, about, you know, sold marketing, which is kind of like, take off our, our old TV show, but you know, there's a lot of ways to, to get that content, that, that curiosity of like, sign up for it, see what, it, listen to something different too. It's like music to like kind of music. Like, I told kinds of music. I don't love everything. I listen to different types of music because you want to get different inputs. You know, I'm not still listening to the same music from the eighties. Well, this works in a while, but I'm not still just got the Bon Jovi cassette tape on replay. Um, speaking of kind of the podcast itself, um, are there, let's say, a couple of podcasts that you would recommend? Well, and, you know, I have a lot of them, you know, on my, on my, and I'm looking at my podcast app because you listen to them and then you, you know, kind of go back and forth. Um, I'm, I'm not, I listen to one that's not, you know, getting different things. I listen to one that is not, it's not marketing related, but it's sports marketing called New Heights because you know, it's a city has the Chiefs, which they get a health team. Um, and one of the players on that has its brother. Um, but I find it, you know, it's like those inputs. Yes, it's around sports, but it's also about life. And they talk about a lot of these different things as two brothers and the things they went through. And they have all these different guests on to talk about different things they've gone through. And, you know, there's funny stories. And so sometimes it's, it's also changing up your environment a little bit too and hearing just different conversations. Um, so I find that one interesting. Uh, it's topical. Uh, sometimes there's those two that's like, it's the hot podcast certainly here because somebody from my own town was you know listens to it um you see you guys have your podcast it's, it's got a lot of great content on there you've had a lot of people um and there's you know that's the yeah. challenge too sir i'm sorry go ahead oh it's a well, you had you a lot you have a lot of good people and clearly you're at the bottom of the list so you're by just oh, anybody no, on now <laughs> but uh um i'm trying to get to my library here um there's an innovative agency. I, I listened to some too about just ideas on running the agency and there's two or three people that do podcasts around running an agency. 
um, sometimes you you also think you haven't figured out. It's like you need to listen to people that will tell you that you'll make you realize, oh wait, I have a lot to learn. There's a lot that I don't know, and that's a big part of it. I think that's been my kind of um, incentive to doing these podcasts myself. Um, there was just a lot of, I just didn't know a lot about SEO in general or digital marketing. And my manager was like, hey, you want to be really good? Host the podcast and kind of ask the question that you have to actual people who know it. You learn and we can pretty much create a podcast based on that. Yeah. Well, that's, there's a, um, there's another book that I talk about with, with folks when they talk about blogs and content. Um, you, they ask, you answer. I think, I oh, forget it. I'll forget the name. I'll have to look it up. Um, but it's about, it, it was a, he was a pool builder. He was a contractor. Um, who was now speaks, he, he went speaks on, um, SEO, um, because he went through and, and really was at the forefront of creating this very, very well done blog that literally answered every question he ever got. And so it's that same, uh, ask the questions you don't know. Well, uh, people, we talk about blog at a basic level. Well, I can't do a blog. I'm not a writer. I say, you get asked questions by customers? Yes. Critical thing here is, can you answer? Well, of course. You've got the outline of your blog. Yeah. Just start exactly. asking those questions, answering them. Post another question, answer it. Because if they're asking you, they're asking Google, they're asking other people. Um, you know, start there. But it's that curiosity part of it. You know, people forget how much knowledge they have within an organization, within a person. Uh, you've done this for a while. Uh, you just don't even realize that you actually know what you're doing. I mean, if you were to, you know, I say you have to have a blueprint. Um, if a home builder's built a home multiple times, he could probably build it pretty easily without, like, he doesn't need a blueprint. Like, he knows. Right. If I say that I can put a door awesome. here and a window here and whatever, he knows how to do that. Or she knows how to do that. They, like, they've done it. So the knowledge is there, but they take it for granted. And so that's part of this idea of sharing information and sharing knowledge out there too, uh, putting it out there. Because they do have, um, there's knowledge that people have and they forget that they have all this knowledge. So that's a great SEO tool is to share, share a lot of that knowledge. Right. And I think one thing that most SEO people are kind of aware of are they are known as problem solvers. So if you want to kind of stay on top of your game, you still need to be curious to solve other people's problems as well. That's number one, for sure. Yeah. There's a, yeah, I think that's, that's probably number one. Um, it's, it's problem solving. Yeah. I think what you've done throughout this entire call has pretty much solved all my problems, all the questions <laughs> that I did have. Do you have any kind of doubts that you have for the podcast as well? Or are we fine? No, I think we're good. I think it was good. It's helpful. It was uh, interesting. Right, cool. So appreciate it. Thank you again so much for that. And um, hopefully we can get to the second episode too. Sounds good. Thanks for watching that episode. I hope you enjoyed. For more videos like this, make sure you like and subscribe.